Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a Vickers No. 1 Mark I, aka a Vickers gas-operated, aka a Vickers Class K gun. These are certainly best known for the fact that the SAS raiders in North Africa mounted them on jeeps. But they were a standard issue weapon for the Royal Air Force, and there's really a lot more of a story behind them before we get to North Africa and the Desert Rats. So uh, this gun is called a Vickers Gas Operated because it's a completely different mechanism, a completely different base gun design than the traditional water-cooled Vickers heavy machine gun that originated, that developed from the Maxim. Uh, basically what happened is after World War I everyone kind of realized that the light machine gun was going to be a big thing, and so the French immediately started working on developing one, and one of the contenders for the French light machine gun was André Berthier. He designs a gun, and he doesn't end up getting a contract, although elements of his gun are built into what the French do adopt, the Châtellerault 2429. In the wake of not getting a contract, Berthier sells his patents and his design to the Vickers company in England. Vickers recognizes that the British are definitely going to want to replace the Lewis gun with a more modern light machine gun, and they think this Berthier design, which is this gas-operated system, very much, I mean, this is developed directly from the Berthier design, um, they think this is their ace in the hole. Like, there's no way the British government won't take a gun that has this design. It's a, a very reliable gun. It's a simple, relatively simple design, and it's manufactured by Vickers. You know, what could go wrong? And for this reason, like, they're not super concerned about the, the slowdown in sales of their water-cooled heavy guns, which are frankly becoming obsolescent. They're not really worried about that through the 1920s and 30s, because they're very confident they're going to get this major British Army adoption. Well, when the British do the trials for their new light machine gun in the early 30s, 1933 or so, uh, Vickers is very much disappointed when the Bren gun wins instead, uh, or what would become the Bren gun, which was the ZB, ZBG-33, based on the ZB-26 out of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and that leaves Vickers kind of, you know, oh, we didn't really have a contingency plan for this, so uh, what do we do now? Well, they do two things. First off, they take this, their Vickers gas-operated gun, in its light machine gun ground configuration, and they also market it to the Indian Army. And the Indian Army actually adopts it and uses it through World War II and are very happy with it. But that's not a ton of guns, and they kind of want more, and they figure, well, there's still one place that the Lewis gun is in use that the British are going to want to replace, and that's in the air service. So the Lewis gun was of course one of the early uh, British aircraft machine guns, and it's pretty well suited for a, you know, a flexible sort of role. They figure, let's take our, our Vickers gas operated, let's crank the rate of fire up to make it more appealing as an aircraft armament, uh, reconfigure it to being an aircraft type gun like this, and try to sell it to the RAF to replace the Lewis gun. And they did that, and in 1935 the RAF did adopt this as an aircraft gun to replace the Lewis, and it was very successful in that role. Uh, of course, production didn't really get going in, in huge scale until 1939, but uh, by 1944 or so they had produced at least 80,000 of these guns, and they were in pretty wide use uh, as a flexible mount gun in the RAF, both for, you know, like a two-seat torpedo bombers, fighter bombers, that sort of thing, where the rear the rear seat had a, a flexible gun mount, uh, and also for use in bombers, in side hatches and in turrets. So uh, that is where this was actually used. Now let's go ahead and take a closer look at it, because there are some really cool elements to it, like this front sight that I want to show you. So this is really a pretty awkward gun to put on camera, as long as we've got the drum magazine on it. So I'm going to go ahead and take that off. We've got a big old magazine catch on the back, very reminiscent of the Vickers Berthier. When I push that forward, it's going to pull this whole locking clamp assembly back, and then the whole magazine just lifts right off the gun. This is the most common version of the magazine. It holds 60 rounds. There was a second version that was made later that is slightly larger, um, that is actually a 100 round drum. It's often referred to as a 96 or a 97 round drum, because uh, the manual actually says to only load that many rounds into it just to maintain the, the spring strength, but it was technically 100. Anyway, that's the 60 here. Note that you've got this nice heavy duty 
uh, carry strap on it so that you can handle this thing fairly easily. Snap it in, lock it down. It's important to remember that as an aircraft gun they weren't really concerned about how handy the drum magazines were, or how bulky the gun kind of was with the drum magazine on it. What was more important was having an extended supply of ammunition that was self-contained that could mount right on the gun, so you didn't have belts flopping around in an aircraft, and you had to change the magazine as little as possible. Here on the right side of the gun we have really the only marks that are on it. Uh, is identified as a Vickers GO, that's gas operated, Mark 1, serial number is 24,000 and change. Uh, these were manufactured during World War II, uh, both at the Crayford and Manchester works that were run by Vickers. We do also have just a few little VAC, uh, which is Vickers Armstrong Company stamps. So there's one on the grip panel, and there's one over here with a British broad arrow proof on the charging handle. In place of the buttstock and traditional pistol grip and trigger assembly that was on the Vickers Berthier, uh, for the gas operated guns they put on a single, like a, a D-handle type grip with a trigger up at the top. So that was nice and convenient for a, an aircraft gunner to make use of. Would also be very convenient for the SAS Raiders to make use of. There is also a safety catch here on the back of the grip, so nice and easily accessible with the thumb uh, when you've got a firing grip on it. This one is not functional at the moment. Um, typically down would be the safe position, and pushed up would be the fire position. The basic mechanical design here is of course you have a gas port in the barrel, uh, pulls gas off to here. You then have a gas piston in the tube under the barrel. There is a compound recoil spring here in the back. And the bolt is a tipping bolt that locks up, as you can see right there, locks up against oh, a locking surface in the back of the receiver. So this fires from an open bolt with a non-reciprocating charging handle. When I pull the trigger, I'll let this down gently, when I pull the trigger the bolt comes forward like that, locks, and fires. So pretty simple overall really. Now in terms of sights we have an aircraft sight. So this is the rear with an aiming circle, and then the secondary circle is uh, allows you to give lead on an aircraft travelling a known uh, speed, or you know, approximate your lead based on how much slower or faster they might be going. I believe uh, this ring is 50 miles an hour relative to the aircraft that you're in. So if you're in a plane going 200 miles an hour and you're shooting at someone who's going to 50, this gives you an approximation of the lead. Now it's a little more complicated than that because of all the angles that you have to take into consideration, but you've got some, some help on that with your front sight. What we have out here is a wind vane type of front sight, and these were used in World War I as well. Uh, they're basically useful anywhere that you have the guns firing at flexible angles into the slipstream around an aircraft. So the point is that these two brackets are going to catch the wind, and they are going to point the front sight into the wind no matter what direction the gun is pointed. So in theory if the aircraft were flying straight forward and the gun were pointed forward it would work just like this. However, if you start to nose down or up, you're going to be firing against wind and gravity, and you're going to need to adjust your aim up or down to compensate, and this wind vane does that for you. Same thing if you turn the gun to the side of the, you know, changing it so it's not pointing in the same direction as the aircraft, this is going to compensate for your offset. This will basically keep your, your aiming position on station with the orientation of the gun and the aircraft. So it's a really, really cool intricate system that they came up with. Uh, like I said, they came up with it during World War I, uh, but it still made sense uh, for these guns because many of these were being mounted in a similar sort of way as guns, as Lewis guns were in World War I. There are a lot of pictures out there of uh, Vickers gas operated uh, guns on scarf rings, just like in World War I. And of course also out here at the muzzle we have this very simple scoop-like uh, flash hider. So I know you guys are going to ask, and I have no idea what the CBTA means, I don't know who painted that on or when. Uh, what I can tell you is of course these were put on jeeps by the SAS in North Africa, uh, or the Long Range Desert Group uh, in North Africa, and they were used because of their aircraft origins, both uh, because they offered a very high rate of fire, which 
Uh, the, these guys were typically shooting up vehicles and aircraft, and the higher volume of fire you can get on in a short time, uh, the more effective the gun will be. Um, in addition, the guns were available, because they were able to be taken off of aircraft that were unserviceable, uh, and dropped onto jeeps. They were guns that weren't easily adapted to an infantry role in the same way that they could be put onto these raiders' jeeps. Um, this would, in fact, set a standard, <laughs> and during Market Garden they did mount some of these guns on jeeps with uh, the 1st Airborne Division. So they did see a similar sort of use there. This never really ended up being the gun that would save the Vickers company uh, in the way that they expected it would. It, it did well for them, uh, and they did sell a lot of them to the RAF, and they did see wide use during World War II. There was actually a version that was developed very late in the war, the number 2, Mark I, uh, actually used for ground service. Uh, what, what initiated this was Royal Commandos actually using the guns modified with Bren gun sights and bipods uh, during Overlord. There were very brief sporadic uses of them elsewhere by airborne troops. Um, this would not continue after World War II. So at some point I'll find a number 2 Mark I ground service version of this to show you, but for the time being we'll, we'll stick to just the aircraft gun. Um, by about 1943 the Browning had replaced... Uh, well, the Browning was taking over as an aircraft gun, and by late in the war rifle caliber machine guns were kind of falling out of favor as aircraft armaments at all, because they just weren't powerful enough to get the job done. Uh, so everyone was kind of transitioning up from 30 caliber machine guns to 50 caliber machine guns, and then to 20 millimeter cannons, and um, in some cases even bigger than that. So by the end of World War II, as an aircraft gun this had become obsolete as well. Uh, production didn't continue after the war. These are tremendously scarce guns in the United States today. They're not exactly common anywhere, but uh, this was a very cool opportunity to take a look at this one, which I think is like a, the only registered transferable um, Vickers K gun in the US. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.